I'm now pleased to introduce the first plenary lecture of the IPC 2021. Our first plenary lecturer is Dr. Daniel Reed. Dan Reed is a research ecologist in the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara in the United States. He received his PhD in 1989 from UC Santa Barbara under the direction of Professor Michael Nuschel. The ecology of Yayan kelp forest has been a primary focus of his research for over 40 years. He has published papers on a broad range of topics in the systems, including dispersal, reproduction, population genetics, trophic interactions, community dynamics, and primary production. Determining the mechanisms that allow kelp forests to recover from natural disturbances and the application of this knowledge to restoration programs designed to mitigate impacts caused by human disturbance has been an ongoing theme of his research. Much of his work the last two decades has been done in association with two interdisciplinary long-term research projects. The Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Program and the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station Mitigation Monitoring Program for which he was the founding principal investigator. Before we begin, please note that you are welcome to begin posting your questions for the very beginning of the lecture in the chat room that you will see display to the right hand side of your screen. Now, please welcome Dan Reed. Um, uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you, Carolina, for um, the very kind introduction. Um, and good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, wherever you may be. Um, I wanna thank Alejandro and Oliver for inviting me to speak with you today. It's, it's truly an honor and a privilege. Um, I also want to thank them and the entire organizing committee for um, uh, their, uh, outstanding efforts to put this uh, conference together in spite of the um, really uh, high adversity, unprecedented adversity associated with the pandemic. And I just want to congratulate all of them on a, on a job well done. <clears throat> well, as my title suggests, what I want to talk to you today is about um, the value of long-term data in studying a short-lived foundation species. And I'd like to begin um, by clarifying um, what I mean by a, a foundation species. Um, and they're, um, the structure and function of uh, many uh, ecological communities is, depends greatly on one or more species that uh, influence um, the other species in the community. And this is something that Paul Dayton recognized early on um, in the early 1970s when he was studying the resilience, the benthic community of McMurdo Sound, Antarctica. And he labeled these species foundation species. And um, uh, Dayton and others that have followed him have defined a foundation species as a species whose structural or functional attributes define an entire community, determine local and regional biodiversity, control ecological dynamics and stability, and modulate critical ecosystem processes. And I'm shown here are images from some of the more iconic foundation species that have been written about in the ecological literature. <clears throat> now, foundation species differ from other uh, ecologically important species in a number of ways. Um, the distinguishing characteristics that, that distinguish foundation species from, say, keystone species or ecosystem engineers or, or other types of uh, ecologically important species are that foundation species are numerically abundant and they account for most of the biomass in an ecosystem. They also have a disproportionately large effect on other species in the community. And they occur at the base of an interaction web in a community such that their interactions with other species are primarily through their structural and functional attributes as opposed to through trophic interactions. Um, now, because many foundation species are a relatively large size and occupy a, a large amount of the biomass in a system, they're often more disproportionately uh, susceptible to disturbance. For example, windstorms will topple trees and leave the understory species largely intact. 
where cyclones and hurricanes can uh, turn a complex three-dimensional uh, structure of a coral reef into a largely two-dimensional pile of coral rubble. Um, also, because they occur in dense aggregations and, and uh, uh, attain high biomass, uh, many foundation species are susceptible to uh, pathogens and um, pests that are able to specialize on a seedful species, such as shown in this North American pine forest here that um, was completely destroyed by a bark beetle infestation. Um, and lastly, human actions that alter land use or, or development um, can lead to the deforestation of foundation species, such as shown here in this uh, mangrove forest in the Maldives, which was completely destroyed and largely turned into a sand barrier island. Similarly, in uh, urbanized areas along um, coast, uh, there can be uh, high rates of sedimentation and, and eutrophication, which as it moves offshore can, it's been known to uh, destroy kelp forests and turn them into uh, much com less complex communities dominated by small turfed algae. Now, um, the loss of foundation species um, actually uh, leads to a change in, in resource availability and uh, abiotic conditions that then can cascade up to affect um, the entire community. And there's concern that disturbances that are causing these losses are increasing in their frequency and severity. Now, because many foundation species are relatively long lived, their loss can have long term consequences that take decades or more to um, actually fully develop. <clears throat> Well, what I've shown here is an illustration and some quotes from a recent paper by Aaron Ellison on some of the ecological underpinnings of foundation species. And in the illustration, he shows a foundation species. In this case, it's the Eastern hemlock um, that is at the base of this interaction web with all these other species. And when disturbances come and remove that foundation species, it breaks down all these interactions and leads to the collapse of the entire ecosystem. Now, in, in the top quote, um, Aaron says that identifying and characterizing the many interactions that foundation species control usually requires long-term observations and manipulative experiments that are done with an eye towards testing the hypothesis that in fact, a particular species is, is really a foundation species. <clears throat> he goes on to say that deciding whether an important species plays a foundational role that's disproportionate to its abundance really requires framing that um, uh, foundational role as a hypothesis rather than simply an assertion. And it turns out that the long lifespan of many foundation species makes it challenging to test this hypothesis because it's difficult to, to test these hypotheses over um, entire lifespans of species uh, that live um, uh, decades or more, much less over multiple generations that experience a wide range of disturbance regimes. So consequently then, the defining characteristics and roles of many foundation species have not been rigorously tested. They've simply been asserted. <clears throat> well, the giant kelp Macrocystis periphera is uh, widely recognized as being an important marine foundation species. It is uh, the largest and most widely distributed of the kelps. It, uh, occurs in both hemispheres. Um, it extends throughout the water column to uh, produce a complex uh, structure that provides support for a diverse array of species and ecosystem functions. And it's been um, uh, considered, this foundational role has been considered since the days of Darwin, where he noticed in his voyage of the Beagle, um, the uh, uh, it, large impact that Macrocystis has on the system. And many of you are probably familiar with some of these quotes from his voyage to the Beagle. But despite the wide recognition of Macrocystis as a foundation species, it turns out there's been very few um, actual studies that have actually tried to test its foundational role or to quantify it. Now, unlike other large foundation species, Macrocystis has a relatively short lifespan on order of a couple of years. And this short lifespan actually facilitates testing its foundational role because it enables experiments and time series observations to be carried out over multiple generations and cycles of disturbance and recovery. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do today in my talk is focus on two aspects of, of uh, long-term research on a short-lived foundation species. I first want to um, 
discuss patterns in, of, of, of abundance and production in macrocystis and uh, talk about some of the work we've done to identify the factors that cause it to vary. I then want to turn to uh, work that we've been doing that's aimed at testing the foundational roles of macrocystis over a wide range of environmental conditions. Now, the work that I'm going to talk about today draws extensively from the Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Program, which is one of 28 um, projects funded by the National Science Foundation um, that uh, forms a part of their uh, uh, long-term ecological research network. Now, um, the 28 uh, programs in, in the network actually encompass a wide range of ecosystem types. The Santa Barbara Coastal LTR is the only um, site in that uh, network that focuses on uh, marine macroalgae, uh, kelp forest in particular. And it was established in the year 2000. So the work I'm going to talk about covers the last two decades. And I really want to acknowledge um, all my many collaborators who contributed substantially to the work that I'm going to uh, show you today. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, macrocystis uh, lives only a couple years. And in Southern California, um, it lives on over about one to three years. And that's seen in these time series graphs here that uh, show the density of macrocystis sporophytes um, on a monthly basis at three reefs over about an 18 year time span. These three reefs are found in, in the Santa Barbara Channel. And what you see is abrupt increases in density in these graphs, which represent um, a, a, a pulse in recruitment of plants, which then decline uh, gradually and, and punctuated in, in sharp declines over the period of the next one to three years. Now, if you look at these time series, you'll see that there's about nine or so non-overlapping generations, which speak to the fact that the vast majority of plants uh, really live only on order of one to three years. The other thing I wanna point out with uh, these data are um, that the, there are substantial differences in the density of macrocystis among these three kelp forests with Mohawk reefs showing the highest densities and Arroyo Burro the lowest. And the reason for these differences really speak to the quality of the habitat on which macrocystis is found. And that's something I'm gonna discuss a little later in my presentation. Well, the, the cycles of abundance that I just showed you are driven in part by the fact that macrocystis extends throughout the water column and its biomass creates substantial drag um, uh, against water motion created by large waves, which makes it disproportionately susceptible to being um, removed during large wave events. And consequently, plants get dislodged and, and set adrift, and many of them end up on the beach. And that can be seen in this, this time series here, where what I plotted in black is the monthly plant loss rate. And loss rate here is expressed as the percent of plants in the, in the population that are lost per day. And in blue is a time series of the monthly um, value of the maximum significant wave height for each month in this time series. And, and what you see is that peaks in plant loss rate tend to coincide with periods of large waves. Um, and um, the, the bottom graph here shows that if you look at the average plant loss rate or the average maximum significant wave height um, for each month of the year that's been averaged over this 18 year time series, what you see is that Loss rates, loss, plant loss rates and um, wave heights tend to be highest in the winter months, which in California occurs in January through about April or so. <clears throat> well, um, I want to be talking a little bit about net primary production. And as, as many of you know, kelps um, have very uh, fast growth rates and um, kelp forests are considered to be among the most productive ecosystems in the world and production is, is often measured in terms of its net primary production. And by that, I simply mean the amount of biomass produced per unit area of the seafloor per unit time. And the amount of uh, net primary production produced in a given year is, is really a function of three attributes. It's a function of how much biomass is there at the beginning of the growth year, which I'm calling initial standing biomass, and the increase in that biomass due to the recruitment of new plants and growth. And so um, measuring net primary production is not a simple task. It usually involves a, a variety of measurements and a number of assumptions. And one can think of net primary production simply as 
uh, the increase in new tissue due to growth and uh, the loss of old tissue. And the way that we've been measuring net primary production in macrocystis is we've been combining field measurements of standing biomass recruitment and loss rates with a model of kelp biomass dynamics to produce uh, mass specific growth rates and, and estimates of net primary production. And the way that we do that is each month we go out and we measure and count the number of plants and fronds on plants uh, and we measure the lengths of them and we uh, convert these lengths to estimates of um, uh, wet mass, dry mass or carbon mass based on morphometric relationships from plants that we've collected over the years and brought back into the lab where we've dissected them and measured them. And from these measurements then we're able to estimate the uh, biomass of, of um, the plants in, the, in fixed plots um, over time. Now we combine these estimates of standing biomass with independent estimates of loss rates of entire plants, of fronds on surviving plants, and we also account for losses of senescence due to uh, uh, senescence of blades and of exudation. Now we've been collecting these data monthly in fixed 40 by 40 meter plots at three sites since 2003. And here's what some of those data look like. What I've shown here is the net primary production in units of uh, grams of dry mass per meter squared per day um, on a seasonal basis at three reefs. And what you can see is that there's tremendous variability within and among years is also uh, among sites. And what this suggests is that short-term measurements, particularly at a single site, are unlikely to capture the the wide range of variation in that primary production of macrocystis, which is characteristic of the species, okay? So um, <clears throat> shown here then are contemporaneous data for the three sources that contribute to variation in macrocystis. Now the top uh, graph here shows a standing biomass in winter, which is the biomass of the growth of the uh, biomass at the beginning of the growth season. The middle uh, row shows a uh, time series of uh, densities of, of new plants, which indicates uh, recruitment for each season in the time series. And the bottom graph uh, is of growth rates expressed as a percent uh, increase in the dry mass of the standing biomass per day. And what you see, each of these variables um, varies substantially, both uh, over time and in space. And we wanted to understand the extent to which each of these variables contributes to the wide variation that we see in net primary production. So we use these data in a multiple regression model. And shown here are the results of that regression. What I plotted is the partial R squares for each of the three variables. And what you see is that the biomass at the beginning of the growth year, this initial standing biomass coupled with recruitment explains about 86% of the variation that we observed in net primary production. So a very large amount of variation explained by these two variables with the lion's share of that variation being explained by initial standing biomass. Now, interestingly growth, which averaged about 4% of the dry mass per day across all years and sites, um, it did not explain any significant variation that we observed in net primary production because it um, didn't meet the significance criteria for entry into the regression model. So what this suggests to us then is that wave disturbance is a primary driver of macrocystis net primary production because it's a major determinant of the standing biomass of macrocystis at the beginning of the growth year. And so this led us to develop two hypotheses. The first being that greater wave disturbance leads to lower annual net primary production and more variable wave disturbance leads to greater variability in annual net primary production. Now we tested these two hypotheses using a regional comparison in which we compared the annual net primary production of macrocystis at nine sites in Southern California with eight sites in Central California over a nine year period. Now the reason we chose these two regions is because they differ substantially in the wave climate, okay? Central California on average uh, wave, significant wave heights are on average twice what they are in Southern California. Now, these are mean values uh, estimated for each month of the year over the nine year study period. Now we estimated the disturbance of macrocystis from waves as the proportion of the, the surface canopy that's removed each winter. 
So shown here is the mean proportion of uh, canopy removed for each site, um, the gray sites being Central or Southern California, the black sites, uh, Central California. And uh, the dashed line represents the average um, across all sites within each region. Now the plot on the right shows a coefficient of variation in this uh, canopy loss, which is an indication of the interannual variability in, in the amount of uh, uh, variation in, in disturbance to macrocystis. And what you can see is that disturbance to macrocystis from winter waves in central California is twice as high and half as variable as it is in Southern California. And that's because the, the low variability in central California simply reflects the fact that nearly every year, the vast majority of the canopy gets removed by wave disturbance. Whereas in Southern California, uh, wave disturbance is much more episodic, occurring over every only uh, couple of years. So if we look at uh, results for net primary production, then we find that they're very consistent with our hypothesis that um, annual net primary production in, in Southern California was twice as high as shown on this figure on the left and twice as variable um, compared to Central California where wave disturbance was twice as high, but only half as variable. Well, the wave climate is not the only thing that differs between these two regions. Uh, Central California, it turns out, is an area of very intense upwelling and consequently concentrations of nitrate, which are the major form of nitrogen that fuels growth in macrocystis, that the concentrations of nitrate in Central California are substantially higher, an order of two to four times higher than they are in um, uh, Southern California. Also, um, uh, sea urchins, which are the primary grazer of kelp in, in uh, kelp forests throughout the world, they're largely absent in Central California. And that's because of the presence of the sea otter, which is a voracious predator on sea urchins. In contrast, sea otters are largely uh, uncommon in Southern California. And as a result, we get um, substantially um, high and variable densities of sea urchins at, at our sites throughout Southern California. So these regional differences in nitrate concentrations and herbivory should favor higher net primary production in Central California compared to Southern California, which is just the opposite of the pattern that we observed. So we conclude from this then that wave disturbance overwhelmed uh, bottom up forcing due to uh, nutrients and the top down forcing due to urchin grazing to control the regional patterns of net primary production in macrocystis. Um, now, um, additional uh, factors that influence the uh, produce variability in the abundance and uh, production of macrocystis include gradual and punctuated changes in ocean climate. And, um, and long-term data are really important for evaluating these kinds of changes because um, they allow one to distinguish uh, such changes from inherent natural variability in a system, which as I just shown with macrocystis is quite large. So we found long-term observations to be very useful when um, examining a, a recent uh, warming event in the North Pacific Ocean, which is known as the blob. And it was one of the most extreme warming events on record. It uh, started in the central North Pacific, extended down to a depth of about 100 meters and had positive temperature anomalies or were greater than three standard deviations. Now, by the beginning of 2014, the blob moved to the mainland coast of North America and extended from the Gulf of Alaska down to uh, Baja, California. Um, and that blob was followed by a very severe El Nino, which prolonged the warming um, through uh, 2015. <clears throat> well, we're able to see the signature of this warming event in our, our uh, time series data at our long-term study sites. And what I've shown here are temperature anomalies at one of our study sites, uh, Mohawk Reef, um, and uh, uh, monthly nitrate anomalies. And um, the warming event, which is I've shaded here in red, you can see the signature here of, of very large positive temperature anomalies um, occurring during the two year period, peaking in September of 2015 when the anomaly averaged uh, four and a half degrees centigrade, positive four and a half degrees centigrade for the uh, entire month. Now, um, coincident with that were uh, large negative anomalies in nitrate, okay, during this uh, entire warming event. And so um, these kinds of conditions are likely to be really adverse to a species like macrocystis because 
like most kelps, Macrocystis thrives in cool, nutrient-rich waters. And heat waves and ocean warming have been implicated as a cause for large regional declines in it in both hemispheres. And it's particularly vulnerable to long warming events uh, such as this due to a variety of characteristics. Namely, that it exhibits rapid year-round growth um, and high biomass turnover such that um, uh, biomass is relatively short-lived. It turns over about once every month or so. Um, and that high growth and, and, and a high biomass turnover uh, requires a relatively high demand of nitrogen, yet the plant itself has a very limited capacity to store nitrogen only of, on order of about three weeks. And so what this means is it requires a near continuous supply of nitrogen for it to grow and for that biomass to persist. So the expectation would be that um, macrocystis growth and standing biomass and net primary production should respond rapidly to prolonged conditions of warm nutrient poor water, which is what we observed in 2014 and 2015. So we were very surprised when we found this not to be the case. Um, what I've plotted here are um, uh, time series data on the percent nitrogen in the tissue of blades shown in the top series of, of graphs, um, uh, estimates of, of growth rate in the middle row of graphs, and net primary production on the bottom row of graphs. And, and on the left is simply a seasonal time series, and on the right are box plots for each of the three different time periods. The white plot shows or the white box shows the 11 year period prior to the warming event. The red box shows the two year warming event and the green box is the four years following the warming. And the, the solid horizontal line in each box represents the median and the dashed line represents the, the mean. And so what we see is that blade nitrogen, there is a marginally significant decrease in the tissue nitrogen of macrocystis during this warming event relative to the period before and after the warming. But that moderate decrease in nitrogen did not translate into significant declines in growth or net primary production, which remained well within the range observed in cooler years. Um, in fact, growth still averaged about 3% dry mass per day during the warming period and, um, and net primary production on order of about 10 grams of dry mass per meter squared per day. So these are really actually substantial values in spite of the large anomalies that we saw in uh, temperature and nitrogen. Um, now, there was an equally unremarkable response in the standing biomass of macrocystis. And what I've plotted here is time series of biomass in the canopy at the surface, uh, the biomass of, of subsurface plants, and then the total biomass, which is a combination of the biomass in the water column and at the surface. And what you can see is that we saw no differences in the, the biomass of any three of these measures among any of the three time periods. There was a tendency for uh, the canopy biomass to be somewhat lower during the warming event compared to uh, the prior period, but the uh, water column biomass actually tended to be a bit higher. But when you actually looked at the total biomass, the, the means for the three periods were nearly identical. So um, our sites in Santa Barbara are located about a thousand kilometers from the um, southern range edge of macrocystis in the northern hemisphere. And it's possible, even likely, that the limited response that we saw to macrocystis due to this large uh, uh, warming event in Santa Barbara was, was not the norm uh, throughout the southern part of the range. And so we wanted to look at that by, and the way we did that was um, we used Landsat satellite imagery. And what we've been able to do over the years is calibrate the reflectance in, in uh, the satellite signal to our um, diver measurements of biomass in our long-term study sites. And so from that, we've been able to develop a a data set on canopy biomass that has spatially contiguous coverage from central California down to the, the uh, end of the range in Baja. And, and this time series goes back to about 1984. So we use the Landsat then to investigate regional differences in the response of macrocystis to this warming event in 2014 and 2015. And the way we did that is we divided the coastline from Santa Barbara to Bahia Asuncion in Baja, Mexico into 100 kilometer segments. And for each segment, we um, 
then calculated the mean sea surface temperature anomaly during the warming event. <clears throat> we also calculated the mean sea surface temperature of the warmest month during that two-year warming period. Now we measured the resistance of kelp to the warming event by, uh, first we calculated what the lowest annual biomass of, of was for each uh, 100 kilometer segment during the two-year warming period. And we compared that biomass, expressed it as a percent of the biomass in the previous five years, which we used as a baseline. And what we found was that the resistance to kelp varied dramatically across uh, this latitudinal gradient um, with a relatively high resistance uh, shown in Santa Barbara and in an intermediate portion of the range down around Ensenada and very low resistance in at San Diego and particularly at the southern end of the range where there's a complete loss of canopy. Um, now it turns out that the geographic differences in kelp resistance to warming here were best explained by the mean sea surface temperature of the warmest month, okay? Um, um, and by contrast, the sea surface temperature anomaly and latitude were very relatively poor predictors of kelp resistance to warming. And then what this suggests then is that um, um, the kelp's resistance to warming is really determined more by its vulnerability to an absolute temperature threshold, which appears to be around 24 degrees centigrade, as opposed to deviations from local average conditions as indicated by, by uh, temperature anomalies. <clears throat> okay, I, I wanna shift a little now from uh, talking about um, patterns and sources of variability in macrocystis abundance and production to um, testing its foundational role in terms of defining community structure, determining local biodiversity, controlling ecological dynamics, or modulating ecosystem processes such as net primary production. Okay, so um, inferred evidence for the foundational role of macrocystis comes from its strong influence on the abiotic environment. Now, many of you are aware that um, macrocystis, like many kelps, uh, have a, can have a profound effect on shading the bottom, and they can drastically reduce the amount of light reaching the bottom by upwards, in this case, of about 99%. <clears throat> macrocystis also uh, can have profound effects on dampening currents, such that the current velocities inside a kelp forest are much lower than those outside the forest. And this can have a uh, very large effects on um, altering the supply and the retention of things like nutrients and propagules and organic matter, including plankton. Now, other inferred evidence for um, the role of Bacrocystis as a foundation species comes from patterns of species covariance, which suggests that Bacrocystis is having a large effect on other species in the community. In this example, what I've shown here is that the percent cover of sessile invertebrates, which is shown in blue, varies inversely with the density of macrocystis or varies uh, uh, positively with the density of, of macrocystis, whereas the percent cover of understory algae shown in green varies inversely or negatively with the density of macrocystis. Now, um, other inferred evidence that macrocystis modulates ecosystem processes comes from the fact that um, Macrocystis alone accounts for about 75% of the net primary production of the kelp forest community, okay, suggesting it's very important in, in net primary production. Okay, so um, now foundational attributes, particularly in the case of macrocystis, are um, really thought of in terms of affecting entire communities. Um, and we've been actually looking at the abundance or measuring the abundance of about 200 taxa of macroalgae invertebrates and fish um, over uh, 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 39 fixed 80 square meter plots distributed among 11 reefs in the Santa Barbara Channel shown by these yellow dots. And we've been collecting these data annually in the summer since 2001. And so ideally one wants to move beyond um, uh, inferred evidence for macrocystis role as a foundation species and testing it um, across a wide range of uh, environmental variability. And we know from the data that we've collected here that the dynamics and structure of these communities actually vary substantially over space and time. So when we, we tested these foundational attributes, 
in a structural equation model, which we use to identify the direct and indirect relationships between macrocystis and the abundance and diversity of different components of the kelp forest community across this wide spatial and temporal gradient. For those of you who aren't familiar with structural equation modeling, it's simply a form of multivariate analysis that's used to identify um, direct and indirect uh, structural relationships in time series data. So here then is, is results from that structural equation model. The, what I'm gonna be showing you is a series of, of red arrows, which represent positive uh, relationships, positive effects, and black arrows, which represent, or red negative and black positive. Uh, numbers uh, associated with the arrows and the width of the arrows indicate the, the strength or, of those relationships, their path coefficients and the R square values in the boxes represent the amount of variation explained by those relationships. So what we see is that macrocystis exerts a strong negative effect on the diversity of understory algae, which in turn has a strong negative effect on the diversity of sessile invertebrates because it's a stronger competitor for space. The algae and invertebrates compete for space on the reef. Macrocystis in turn then has a positive indirect effect on the diversity of these invertebrates, largely that stems through its negative effect on algae, which in turn has a negative effect on the invertebrates, okay? Well, these positive effects of macrocystis actually um, uh, go up towards uh, to higher trophic levels, um, mainly mobile predators that use uh, the structure of macrocystis for uh, foraging habitat, and they also um, use invertebrates for food. Now, a somewhat not surprising, but nonetheless very important result was that we found very strong positive relationships with hard substrate and negative uh, relationships with sea urchin biomass that affected not only macrocystis, but other um, parts of the kelp forest community. And um, this is really important because in Southern California, um, hard substrate or the amount of sand can be highly variable. Sands are always shifting around. And so the the uh, cover of sand on reefs can be very dynamic, as can the biomass of sea urchins, as urchins tend to aggregate and disaggregate as they form grazing fronts uh, across these reefs. So when one is assessing the foundational role of macrocystis and trying to generalize from it, it's really important to capture the wide range of environmental conditions in which macrocystis grows in. And that can really only be done with long-term spatially uh, extensive data. Um, well, the International Panel for Climate Change has predicted that um, the uh, severity and frequency of, of, of wave disturbance is predicted to increase in the future, okay? So this leads to um, an obvious question as to how are kelp forests going to respond to a future scenario characterized by a higher frequency of intense wave disturbance? Well, based on macrocystis foundational role, um, we hypothesize that an increase in the frequency of severe winter storms will alter macrocystis biomass and net primary production to influence the kelp force uh, uh, community structure. And one can think of that as occurring in a scenario where when there's just occasional wave disturbance that can lead to a high biomass of macrocystis, which then might favor sessile invertebrates, Whereas when there's frequent um, storms that, that uh, really greatly reduce the biomass of macrocystis, that might lead to a, a community dominated by understory macroalgae. So we tested this hypothesis in a decade long experiment in which we removed macrocystis from a 2000 square meter plot um, each winter over a 10 year period to simulate the effects of increased frequency of disturbance on macrocystis. Now, when macrocystis is removed, I, I wanna clarify that we only removed macrocystis in the winter and it was allowed to grow back and typically would form a canopy by the end of the year. Now we compared uh, this removal treatment to a control plot, similar size control plot, um, where macrocystis was only subjected to natural disturbance. In each plot, we then measured the biomass and species richness of macroalgae and sessile invertebrates, and also the net primary production of, of macroalgae. And we, we made these measurements on a seasonal basis over a 10 year period. So these are results um, from that experiment. And what I've plotted here in blue is the 
time average mean over the 10 years with a, a, the error here is a standard error. And in green, um, so this is the time average uh, mean of the uh, control or the experimental plot. That is the, a plot where macrocystis was removed once a year in winter. And the green circles represent the mean of the control plots. And the, the top row graph shows the response uh, in biomass of macrocystis, understory algae, sessile invertebrates. The middle row shows responses to uh, net primary production of macrocystis, understory algae, and the two combined. And the bottom row shows changes in species richness of understory algae and sessile invertebrates. And what you see is not too surprising. The biomass and, and net primary production of macrocystis significantly declined when disturbance frequency to macrocystis was increased. Nonetheless, we still saw substantial biomass and net primary production of macrocystis um, in the removal plot as macrocystis would recruit back into these plots. But um, that recruitment and growth during the year was not sufficient to compensate for the loss of kelp at the beginning of the year. Now the middle uh, panel or column of graphs shows that um, understory algae actually responded quite favorably to increased um, uh, uh, disturbance to macrocystis, both in terms of its biomass, large increases in its net primary production, and also an increase in the number of species or species richness. Whereas sessile invertebrates showed the opposite response. They actually declined in a plot with an increased frequency of disturbance, declined in abundance, and also declined in species richness. I want to turn your attention to the large increase in net primary production of understory macroalgae, um, because that large increase was not sufficient to offset the, the decline in, in net primary production by macrocystis. So consequently, this led to an average decline of about 41% of net primary production by the kelp forest community. Okay. Well, time average means such as these don't tell the whole story. And what one would really like to do is see how the changes in the community uh, changed over time. And so what I plotted to show that is for each year, I plotted the difference between the removal plot and the control plot. And so negative values then represent um, a decrease in a variable in response to increase a disturbance frequency and positive values indicate the variable increased. And so what we found then is that the negative effects of increased disturbance frequency to macrocystis on macrocystis biomass, net primary production and sessile inverts, those negative increases were still increasing after 10 years. Whereas the, uh, the positive effects of increased uh, disturbance frequency on understory biomass and production was still increasing after 10 years. Now, these results that I've showed you are from a single kelp forest site. Now, we actually replicated this experiment at five kelp forests that varied with respect to sea urchin density and sand cover. And this created a gradient in habitat quality with respect to macroalgal biomass, because we're able to show that uh, the density of sea urchins and the cover of sand is, uh, is, is uh, directly uh, related to uh, the biomass of algae on each of these reefs. So um, high quality sites then are really those sites uh, that have relatively low cover of sand and low uh, biomass of sea urchins where uh, low quality sites tend to have either um, a high uh, densities of sea urchins or high cover of sand. And so what we found then was the effects of increased disturbance frequency on the foundational attributes of macrocystis were strongest in high quality habitats, greater or intermediate and medium quality habitats and lowest in low quality habitats. And this is seen in these graphs here where I plotted uh, the difference between the removal and the control plots over time um, uh, for low quality, medium, and high quality sites for both uh, the net primary production of macrocystis and net primary production of understory algae. And you can see that the largest, the greatest response was in these high quality sites. So collectively, what results from this decade long experiment um, show is they emphasize the value of um, maintaining experiments, spatially replicated experiments over the long term when testing hypotheses pertaining to foundation species. Now, had we run this experiment for only two to three years, which is an average duration of field experiments in ecology, um, we would have um, greatly underestimated the effects of disturbance frequency 
on, on uh, the kelp forest community. As it was, the effect sizes were still increasing after 10 years, okay? Um, in contrast, had we only done this experiment at a single site, say a high quality site, we would have greatly over-exaggerated or over-generalized the foundational role of macrocystis across the wide range of habitats where it's found. <clears throat> well, another important attribute of foundation species is their ability to stabilize the communities that um, they occur in. And by stabilization, I simply mean the ability to dampen temporal fluctuations in those communities. Now, community stability is often measured in terms of the aggregate biomass of a community. And it's typically expressed as a ratio of the time averaged mean of that biomass over the time average standard deviation of biomass. Well, Thibault and Connolly showed that community stability is really a function of two attributes, a function of species stability and species asynchrony. Now, species stability is simply the weighted average stability of the populations of the individual species that comprise that community. And uh, aggregate community tends to be relatively stable when the populations of the individual species are relatively stable. And those shown here in this illustration here, where the colored lines represent the dynamics or biomass of the individual species, and the dashed line is the sum of their aggregate biomass, okay? Consequently, when those populations of individual species fluctuate over time, that leads to much larger fluctuations in their aggregate biomass leading to an unstable state. <clears throat> okay, now species asynchrony simply represents the degree to which the individual species or populations of species that comprise the community, the degree to which they fluctuate out of sync with each other. Now, when, when these populations are highly asynchronous, then that tends to result in a relatively stable um, uh, community because decreases in the biomass of one species are offset by increases in the biomass of another species. In contrast, when species so large fluctuations that uh, are synchronous uh, with each other, then that seems to magnify the, the variability in the aggregate community leading to a relatively unstable community. Now, um, stability is a, a critical component of, of Dayton's original definition of uh, foundation species, yet the role of a foundation species in stabilizing the community that it defines has rarely been examined. And I think really that's because uh, that many foundation species are actually relatively long lived and it's very difficult to examine stability on a community that's dominated by a species that lives for decades to centuries. So the question remains then, do species stable, foundation species stabilize the communities they define? Now, foundation species, by definition, enhance biodiversity. And theory predicts that biodiversity will dampen temporal fluctuations. That is, it will increase the stability of a community. And it can do this in a number of ways. It can do this through overyielding, in which species simply do better in the presence of other species. Or it can do this via asynchronous population dynamics, which are driven by things like competition for shared resources between species. Um, or uh, by the fact that species may show differential responses to the same environmental conditions, or simply due to statistical averaging that results from the fact that the more species there are, the more likely some species will decline while other species increase. Now, support for this theory comes from controlled field experiments in grassland systems that has been championed by Dave Tillman and his colleagues at um, the Cedar Creek Long Term ecological research site. Um, and, and what they've been able to show through um, uh, some very elegant long-term experiments is that uh, uh, stability or uh, the richness of, of, of grasses, the number of species uh, actually stabilizes the, the community biomass. And they've been able to identify the ways in which it's able to do that. Now, it turns out observational studies done in a wide range of uh, ecosystem types that are they're more correlative in nature, um, have the evidence for supporting the theory has been much more equivocal. And that's thought to be due to the fact that environmental variation may play a, a large role in determining whether or not uh, diversity tends to stabilize communities. So 
we were very interested in looking at the degree to which diversity in kelp forest systems serves to stabilize the community. And we decided to focus on the community of understory macroalgae. Um, and uh, because species of macroalgae uh, compete for uh, common resources, namely light and space, to some degree nutrients, and, um, and they're more likely to show asynchronous dynamics. <clears throat> so what I've plotted here is the mean species richness of macroalgae in each of the 39 plots over this 18 year time series. And I plotted that against the stability, the aggregate um, uh, stability of the aggregate biomass of, of those species um, over that 18 year time series. And what we found is this positive significant relationship, which is very consistent and supportive of, of the theory, okay? Um, we found that community biomass increased by about 315% along this natural gradient of species richness, okay? So this led us to question then, what drives this positive relationship between diversity of macroalgae and, and their stability? And secondly, does the stability of macrocystis enhance species richness in ways that then enhances uh, community stability? <clears throat> so species richness can affect community stability directly or it can affect it indirectly by affecting species stability or species asynchrony. And now giant kelp stability can also affect community stability directly, okay, through this path here, or indirectly through its effects on species richness, species stability, or species asynchrony. And lastly, all of these variables can be affected by um, a variation in the environment that affects macroalgae, and that can alter the degree to which these relationships or the strengths of these various relationships. So again, we turn to structural equation modeling using this 18 year time series um, to examine the direct and indirect paths through which giant kelp stability may influence the stability of the understory macroalgal community. And we found um, strong support for Cabot and Thibault and Connolly's uh, uh, view that species stability and species asynchrony um, explains community stability. We found in the case of understory macroalgae that 96% of the variability in community stability was explained by these two factors with species stability explaining about twice the amount of variation of species asynchrony. <clears throat> we also found that species richness had a positive effect on community stability through uh, by indirectly affecting species stability and species asynchrony. Again, the effect on species stability was much greater than species asynchrony. We did not find a positive direct relationship from species richness to community stability, such as what I showed you in the univariate analysis in an earlier slide, okay? Um, and also we found that kelp stability has a positive effect on species richness. And by that positive effect, it then has an indirect effects on community stability, a positive effect. So stability of kelp enhances community stability by affecting species richness. Now the direct effect of uh, kelp stability on community stability, um, although it was significant in a univariate analysis, it was not significant in the structural equation model, which takes into account a much wider range of variables. Now, when we decomposed uh, kelp stability into the mean of its biomass and the standard deviation of its biomass, we found that the mean of kelp uh, biomass um, was unrelated to the stability of the understory algal community, whereas the standard deviation in kelp biomass was negative related to the sphinx. So what this suggests then is that stability of kelp um, that influences richness to affect the algal community is really driven by the variance in kelp biomass rather than the time average mean. <clears throat> Now, importantly, we found that um, the relationships between kelp stability and community stability were largely robust to strong environmental variation. Um, for example, uh, the strong positive association between kelp stability and species richness still held um, in spite of the negative effects of temperature on these two variables and the sordid effects of grazing topography and depth on species richness, okay? So um, this is really important because it shows that um, the effects of kelp stability on richness and community stability is really robust to 
the uh, high degree of environmental variability that it is, is found in. And lastly, we um, did similar analyses on the sessile invertebrate community and the combined community of sessile invertebrates and understory macroalgae, and we obtained very similar results, which suggests that the foundational role of macrocystis in stabilizing the community extends to the broader reef community. So in conclusion then, I've tried to highlight the value of long-term observations and experiments in ecology, even when studying um, short-lived species like macrocystis. Now, by many standards, uh, data spanning two decades such as ours is not particularly long-term. Um, however, um, I do believe that our results serve to demonstrate the value and need to maintain time series observations and experiments well into the future. Um, uh, particularly given the uh, rapid rate of environmental change that's going on in the world today. Um, now, such long-term observations and experiments are really important for testing the generality of ecological constructs and theory over a wide range of environmental conditions in community states. Such, um, <clears throat> this is particularly true uh, um, uh, in the case um, when testing uh, the uh, uh, attributes of whether or not a species applied to the foundation species concept. It's really important to have long-term uh, uh, experiments and that cover a, a wide range of environmental conditions and disturbance regimes um, uh, to test these uh, attributes of uh, foundation species, which in many cases have simply um, been asserted without the quantitative test or analysis. Now, long-term data are also important for assessing um, the consequences of environmental change, both punctuated and gradual change, um, because they allow one to distinguish such changes from inherent natural variability, which in the case of macrocystis can be quite large. Oh, they also can reveal surprises um, that really run counter to conventional wisdom, such as what we found when assessing the the response of macrocystis to uh, an extreme warming event, or when we discovered that its net primary production um, in Southern California was twice that of Central California, despite uh, concentrations of nutrients and rates of grazing being much uh, uh, different um, in Central California or Southern California. And lastly, um, Long-term observations and experiments are really valuable for directing future research and the long-term data are particularly important for parameterizing predictive models that are aimed at um, uh, uh, under uh, identifying key processes that underlie the structure and function of natural communities and the extent to which they might vary in the future. And um, with that, I just want to give thanks again to my funding sources and to all, all the tremendous work by my colleagues. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for your lecture, Dan. Really interesting. Now, we have lots of questions on the chat. I will start with the first one, Alejandro Bushman is asking, you indicate with a picture that a high level of kelp biomass and on the beat in winter, do you have an idea how much goes into the deep sea? Uh, that's a very good <laughs> question, and we don't. You know, it's it's been difficult to track transport offshore. Um, we are getting working on getting estimates of how much ends up on the beach. Um, the rest of it is, uh, and much of what ends up on the beach gets decomposed and consumed on the beach. Some of it gets washed back out into the ocean. Um, there's many different forms. A lot of that turns into very small particulate forms and dissolved forms, which then gets dispersed out in the ocean. How much of that ends up getting sequestered in the deep sea is, is really unknown. And I, I wish I had an answer for you, but um, you know, my intuition is it's a in our system, it's a pretty small fraction of, of the total production. Okay. Let's go with Rafael Barti Dextro. Professor Reed, is it possible to estimate if the regrown of macrocystis has a direct effect on the diversity of marine life in those areas? 
I, I, I'm sorry, Carolina. It, it is, it, can you repeat the question for me? It is possible to estimate if the reground of macrocystis has a direct effect on the diversity of marine life in those areas? The, the regrowth of macrocystis, you mean once it's removed, the new plants that come in? Is, is, that, so. is that the question? Um, no, absolutely it does. Um, there's still, a, you know, there's still a decent amount of production that's going on. The plants are still providing structure, so fish will aggregate to, to, uh, to kelp. Um, so, so absolutely it does. Okay. Inka Barst, oh, sorry for my pronunciation, ask, how do you measure biomass turnover? Okay, so biomass turnover is simply uh, expressed, typically expressed as a ratio of the biomass to net primary production. So it's, it's just a ratio. And so what we see is the, that ratio is about on order of, of 12. So it's, it's a, um, uh, if you look at the annual net primary production and divide it by the average annual standing biomass, that's the ratio, that's an estimate of turnover. Okay. Um, Ligia Goyalo Vilos asks, do you see phosphate limitation that could affect growth? Uh, you know, I'm, again, Carolina, could you repeat one more time for me? Do you see phosphate limitation that could affect growth? Phosphate limitations. Is that the question? You know, um, that's really not been looked at much in our system. I think phosphate in, um, in the uh, North Pacific gyre, certainly the California current is not really thought of as a, a limiting nutrient um, for macroalgae or for phytoplankton in, in general. And so I think it's generally considered to be um, insufficient. It, um, so uh, we've not seen any evidence of phosphate limitation. We, we not focused on that. We do have measurements of it, but we've not focused on it. Okay. We have a question from Erasmo Macaya. Are those Southern and Central sites in California the same ecotypes? Have you measured any genetic difference among populations? You know, I'd really like to turn to my colleague, Philippe Alberto, Albert. who's really led those studies for us. So we've, we've uh, and, and he and his colleagues, I've been a co-author on a lot of this work, but my, my, um, um, work on it, it's largely been, you know, he's done the lion's share of the genetics. And so, yeah, he, he, you can very much using microsatellites, very much discriminate um, uh, uh, genetic differences among those populations. And so uh, there's not thought to be a lot of connectivity between Central California and Southern California, largely due to the abrupt transition at point conception, which separates them. Okay. Wow, we have a this is a very good question. Thierry Tivot, do you think that associated bacteria fixing atmospheric nitrate can play a role in the growth of macrocystis? Yeah, you know, I've only read a little bit about that. There's a, a, a researcher named Doug Capone at the University of Southern California, and he's worked a bit on nitrogen fixing bacteria and how they might um, influence uh, uh, growth in giant kelp. And I think what he's concluded is that they probably are contribute only a small portion of the nitrogen demand to kelp. Um, what we're actually finding is that, um, that uh, I mean, in Southern California, nitrate um, concentrations average less than um, one micromolar for about five months of the year. And we actually are finding that during those time periods, other forms of nitrogen, particularly ammonia and urea, are really important in sustaining the growth of macrocystis during periods when nitrate is, is low, which we think is what helped explain um, uh, the growth in, in biomass of macrocystis sustained during this warming event when nitrate levels were extremely low. Okay. Um, because of the time, I'm going to do the last question. Uh, Alan Critchley, very interesting, thank you. What happened when you superimpose mechanical harvesting disturbances on top of these natural changes? Do you have data from harvested versus non-harvested areas? 
Yeah, and so, um, you know, harvesting in kelp in California was a huge industry for uh, um, the better part of the last century. Um, and um, the main harvester, uh, 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 Kelco, which was part of a, a Merck, um, they actually ceased operations in the early 2000s. And um, since then, the amount of harvesting that's gone on is actually uh, quite limited. It's limited largely to uh, uh, fodder for shellfish uh, uh, farms. Um, the work that was done back in the 60s and 70s when Kelco, they were harvesting about 100,000 wet tons of kelp per year. And the work that was done back then suggests that um, harvest had a relatively little impact on, on populations of kelp. The restrictions are that it, they can only harvest the top meter or so of the canopy. And um, the companies actually were very good at optimizing harvest to maximize uh, production. So they wouldn't harvest the entire canopy, but they'd harvest strips through the canopy. And they, they found out that harvesting on order of um, they'd limit it to maybe two or three times a year. And um, there was no any indication of the work done back in the 70s and 80s that that was having an adverse effect on, on, um, on kelp populations. But harvesting now in California is much reduced. And so it's really unlikely to have any measurable impact at all now. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. It was an awesome talk, really. <laughs> um, and before saying goodbye, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow we will start the live transmission at 10 a.m. Chilean time with the plenary lecture of Dr. Susan Coelho and the questions and answer session at 11.15. Thanks to everyone and enjoy the Ficology during this week. Bye. <laughs>